by Jamar Chase. So we've had two weeks of Jamar Chase not really being Jamar Chase. In week one, he went six for 62 against the Patriots. And then this past week, four for 35. Now, I can't really sit here and tell you that his peripherals have been unbelievable because they haven't. In week one, he had a 20.7% target share. In week two, it was only 14.7%. But as we know, Jamar Chase didn't have a typical summer due to his contract situation. And as we know, Jamar Chase, there's a lot of evidence that he's an elite wide receiver. Throughout his three years in the league, his target share per game rate, it's been about 26%. There's a chance that the Chase manager in your league is frustrated right now. And maybe they're nervous because T. Higgins could be coming back soon. But the thing is, historically, that hasn't really been that big of a deal. Jamar Chase's target share per game with and without T. Higgins has been basically the same. The main reason to buy right now, aside from the fact that he's an extremely good player who's just kind of underperformed, Cincinnati in week three, they get Washington. The commanders have arguably the worst secondary in football, and it's been that way for about a year now. Early numbers show that it's the most advantageous matchup for wide receivers. That's according to my adjusted fantasy points allowed method. So if you're going to buy Jamar Chase, right now is probably the time to do so. Hold Chase Brown. So let's stick with Cincinnati. Let's just shift our focus to that backfield. As you guys know, I talk about ambiguous backfields all the time. I talked about it throughout the summer. I've talked about it for years. And this Cincinnati Bengals group was one that I highlighted. We saw Chase Brown get a lot of hype in July and August, and he was rising in rankings. But as usual, it was important to not get too hyped up about it. That's why Brown and Moss ended up in the same tier for me. Now, some might see that as a cop-out. I didn't take a strong enough stand because both guys were in the same tier. But running back has a lot of factors to it that are out of our control. Coaching decisions drive the volume of these running backs see. And we're seeing that go down in Cincinnati right now. Zach Moss has dominated touches. He's dominated snaps through two games. He's seen three quarters of the team's running back rushes. Chase Brown, just one quarter of them. Zach Moss is the one who's running more routes. So in shallower leagues, I can understand dropping Chase Brown. But in 12-team leagues with normal size benches, I would wait a couple of weeks. Cincinnati's offense has not been that great. And the underlying metrics between Zach Moss and Chase Brown, they've favored Brown. Moss has seen more stack boxes, yes. But Brown has been significantly better according to Next Gen stats and expected points added per rush, success rate, rushing yards over expected per attempt, and 10 plus yard run rate. Now I get it, it's a tiny sample, but it really has not been close. So at the very least, Chase Brown right now, he's a handcuff. He's someone that you can just stash on your bench. But there's still time for him to create a larger role for himself. Moss hasn't run away with that job, even if his peripherals are far, far better. Add Carson Steele and Samaj P. Ryan. So Isaiah Pacheco fractured his fibula on Sunday. He's going to be out for an extended period of time. If you look at the Chiefs running back depth chart, it's really, really lacking. And the question right now is, which running back should we prioritize off the waiver wire? And I don't know if I have a clear-cut answer. Let me just give you some information. So first off, I think the Chiefs could end up adding more to this backfield. It was reported that Kareem Hunt was visiting with the team on Monday. So who knows which direction that goes in. But Carson Steele got some short yardage work. He got some goal line work in week two. We should expect him to probably play that role with Isaiah Pacheco sidelined. P. Ryan, meanwhile, he's played as the third down back. And we have years of data showing that P. Ryan's a reliable pass catching threat. Just last year, he had a target share above 10%. And he's seen a few targets in 2024. And remember, he just joined the team. It hasn't been that long that he's been a Kansas City Chief. So strictly from a projection standpoint, Steele's probably going to see more early down work. But P. Ryan's going to still be sprinkled in. And I think P. Ryan is going to be the pass catcher. So it is a messy situation, but these two running backs do kind of complement each other. A potential problem, though, is that Clyde Edwards-Alaire could return in a couple of weeks. We don't know either way right now. So if he does return, it's just going to make the situation even muddier. Now, one thing I do think is worth noting is that at the end of that game, when Isaiah Pacheco was already out, Carson Steele was in the lineup. He was seeing touches. He was trying to close things out or at least get them in field goal range. 
If that didn't happen, I think I'd more easily lean Samaj P. Ryan off the waiver wire this week. And in PPR formats, I'd probably still go in that direction. Probably. Clearly, there's not much conviction here. I think both of them should probably go for a similar dollar value, just based on the information that we have right now. But I think it's important to not overstate this situation. Yes, it's the Kansas City Chiefs, but the value of a running back in that offense is when that running back sees all of the touches. It's when that running back has a clear workhorse role. And I don't know if one of these running backs is going to emerge and be that guy. By Chris Alave. A lot of Alave owners are probably discouraged right now. The Saints have been the best offense in football through two weeks, and Chris Alave has about 16 PPR points. Rashid Shahid has been the wide receiver that you want out of that offense. Now, Shahid is here to stay. I liked him a lot entering the year. He was part of the draft guide. But don't let his big plays overshadow Alave's talent. It's similar to what I talked about on last week's mailbag episode. Alave's been above a 2.0 yards per route run rate in each of his first two seasons. As I talked about last week, only very good wide receivers typically get to those marks. And he's coming off a game against Dallas where he had a 43% target share. The Saints just didn't throw the ball a lot because of game script. They had these huge plays that converted to touchdowns and game script just didn't favor them. And Chris Olave, by the way, was very, very close to scoring. The Saints offense, though, this is something I talked about last week on the 10 Trends episode. It's completely different year over year. Clint Kubiak is offensive coordinator now. They're running a ton more play action and a lot more motion. In fact, last year they were dead last in play action rate. Right now, they're first. If someone's worried about Chris Olave's role in this offense, you need to take advantage because these game scripts are not going to happen every week. Add Derek Carr. Since we're talking about the Saints, since we're talking about the passing attack, let's just get it out of the way. Derek Carr should be added this week. Now, he has a 12.8% touchdown rate. That's not sustainable. But like I just mentioned with Alave, there have been real changes to this Saints offense year over year. It's not like it's the exact same offense and all of a sudden Derek Carr is just thriving in it. It's a completely new system. The increase of motion, the increase of play action passing, alongside pretty usable weapons, it's allowed Carr to thrive during these first two games. But yeah, we should expect regression. He's not going to finish the season with a 12% touchdown rate. That's absurd. But I do think there's a legit chance the Saints are one of the surprise offenses this year. I mean, they kind of already are. So why can't Derek Carr be one of the surprises, the surprise pocket passer quarterbacks that are relevant in fantasy football? Sell J.K. Dobbins. So this transaction, like most sell transactions, it needs a disclaimer. You're not forcing a trade with J.K. Dobbins this week. You're not aggressively looking to get rid of him. Okay? Deal? We're good? The reason I'm listing Dobbins as a sell is because a lot of fantasy managers just look at stat lines. They're not digging into the peripherals. They're not looking at context. And Dobbins, before Monday Night Football, because I'm recording this before Monday Night Football... He's fantasy football's RB3 in PPR formats. And he's doing that with a 45.8% running back rush share and a 9.3% target share. Since 2011, we haven't had a single top 10 running back finish from a running back who finished the year with a sub 50% running back rush share and a sub 10% target share. That's on a per game basis. We haven't seen it. It's not surprising that according to PFF's expected fantasy points formula, Dobbins is playing 11.8 PPR points per game above expectation right now. That's because he's not seeing a bell cow workload, but he's getting a lot of fantasy production. He's scoring touchdowns from well outside the goal line. That's not that sustainable. As much as I want it to be sustainable, because I have J.K. Dobbins too, I know that it's not sustainable. And the Chargers have run it twice within their opponent's 10-yard line through two games. Dobbins only has one of those two carries. Gus Edwards has the other one. So it's not even a lock that when they're at the goal line, that J.K. Dobbins is the goal line back. And let's be real, the Chargers have faced two very friendly game scripts to start the season. They got a Raiders team in week one who did play better in week two, but they still might not be amazing against the run. And then in week two, they faced the Panthers. The Panthers might be the most depressing football team that I've ever watched in my life. Things likely won't be that easy when they face the Steelers and the Chiefs in weeks three and four. 
And that's definitely the concern here. I talked about the Chargers early season schedule about a month and a half ago on this podcast. We knew that this was coming. Entering the year, we knew that the Chargers could get off to a hot start on the ground and that their defense could see some favorable matchups and be relevant in fantasy. Now that it's happened, we can't lose sight of that. Now, to me, there's zero doubt in my mind that J.K. Dobbins is the better running back between himself and Gus Edwards. Hypothetically, he should get more work as the season goes on. But my fear is, will the Chargers actually do that? Will they lean on him knowing his injury history? Because how they're using him right now, it's very, very efficient. It's very effective. And shouldn't we be at least a little bit concerned about his injury history? At least to some degree? There are going to be league mates out there who understand all of this context. But there's also going to be league mates who don't. Who see how Dobbins has performed, and they think that this is the way he's going to perform for the rest of the season. And let me just give you an example. This is very unscientific, but it's at least something. I put a poll out on Monday asking who people preferred rest of season between J.K. Dobbins and Jameer Gibbs. And I specified that it was a PPR format. And while Gibbs won the poll, which he should have won the poll, it was still an 80-20 split. Despite the fact that Gibbs is younger, he's in the better offense, he has almost the exact same running back rush share, he has a better target share, and he's the more explosive player. Now you can sit here and say, well, David Montgomery is going to get all the goal line rushes. Number one, we don't know if that's totally true. But number two, Gus Edwards is there with J.K. Dobbins as well. And the Lions offense projects to be better than the Chargers offense. Look, at the end of the day, you're not trading away J.K. Dobbins for anything. I'm giving you this recommendation to see if you can massively profit right now. Because there's still a chance that in my rest of season rankings that I like Dobbins more than consensus does. That was the case last week. The point here is that you're looking at J.K. Dobbins off of two monstrous games. There's a chance that you could massively profit from that. Add Jalen Tolbert. The Cowboys have needed a secondary pass catcher to really step up. Jalen Tolbert kind of did that in week two. He saw his route participation go from 69% in week one to 89% in week two. And he got a target share bump. He had a 6.5% target share in week one. It was 22.5% in week two. Now, the Cowboys did have a weird script against the Saints, but Tolbert still came out with six catches for 82 yards. There's a chance they want to feature him more moving forward. Add Bucky Irving. I mentioned Irving on last week's 15 transaction show, but he wasn't specifically called out with his own transaction because there were just a ton of backup running backs that sort of crammed together in one transaction. But this week, he gets his own special place on this list. He didn't see that big of an increase in usage week over week. His running back rush share increased by about four percentage points. But Rashad White continues to struggle on the ground. According to Next Gen Stats, only Trey Benson, Javante Williams, and DeAndre Swift have worse yards over expected per attempt rates. White ranks in the bottom six in success rate, too. Irving, on a per-touch basis, has been better than Rashad White on the ground this year. And this is kind of similar to what I talked about with Chase Brown earlier, where the backup running back is just running better than the starter on a per-touch basis. The difference is that White's a good pass catcher and he has more talent than someone like Zach Moss. But we could slowly see a change happen in Tampa Bay. And Irving also has injury upside. And right now, Rashad White is dealing with a minor groin injury. So it makes all the sense in the world to add Bucky Irving. Add Jordan Whittington. So Puka Nakua, he's out for an extended period of time. We know that. But now Cooper Cup is banged up. He suffered an ankle injury. He missed the second half of Sunday's game. Now, I mentioned last week that rookie Jordan Whittington was more of a slot guy. He's more of a one-to-one replacement with Cooper Cup. Before going down, Cup had run 69% of his routes from the slot on the season. Whittington stepped into that role when Cooper Cup was injured. He ran nine of his 13 routes from the slot. He's the more direct replacement for Cooper Cup, and that makes him a smart ad this week. And for the record, I mentioned to Marcus Robinson and Tyler Johnson last week, that's why they're not getting a transaction. But those guys should still be rostered too. By Brock Bowers. One of the few bright spots at tight end this season has been the rookie Brock Bowers. The dude has been a monster. Pre-Monday Night Football, he's the only tight end with double-digit PPR points in each of his first two games. 
he's seen a 25% target share. That's the third highest in the league at the position. Now, Bowers is being called out here because he hasn't necessarily had this blow-up game yet. The market probably isn't high enough on him because to me, he's easily a top five tight end, like easily. There are plenty of valid arguments to be made that he's the tight end two, maybe even the tight end one in fantasy football. And we're saying that already as a rookie, as in he's only played two games in the NFL. Bowers was an elite prospect who had an elite score in my prospect model. And he's already showing up in a pretty mediocre offense. We should feel very excited about having Brock Bowers on our team. So there's a chance that people just haven't caught up yet. We see this a lot with young players. People are skeptical. They're concerned that there's just this blip. But usually the opposite is happening. If a talented player like Brock Bowers or like what we saw with Malik Neighbors this past week or Marvin Harrison Jr., when they have those games, you buy into them. You don't run away from them. And with Brock Bowers, he hasn't had this massive productive day. I'm talking like obvious tight end one performance. He's just been very, very steady with very, very good peripherals. And that's why he might be a nice buy. Add Hunter Henry. So I mentioned that Brock Bowers is third in the NFL in tight end target share. You know who's number one? Yeah, it's clearly Hunter Henry. That's why I'm talking about him. In week two, Hunter Henry saw a 50% target share. He saw half of New England's targets. His route participation over the first two games, 82% and 87%. Those are both elite numbers. Given the state of the tight end position, Hunter Henry needs to be added. Add Quentin Johnston. So as we know, Quentin Johnston had a pretty miserable rookie season. But year two is different. He's got this new offensive system. He's got new coaches. He's playing a different role in this offense. He's seen target shares in his first two games of 21% and 32%. Last season, he didn't have a single game with a target share above 20%. And then in week two, he went off for five catches, 51 yards, and two touchdowns. Now, I will be honest. I don't think you should go absolutely nuts off the waiver wire for Quentin Johnston. Because typically, how a wide receiver or really any player performs during his rookie season that's predictive for what's to come. Not only that, but the Chargers have been a bottom 10 team in neutral script pass rate through the first two weeks. We know they want to run the football. So these high target shares that Quentin Johnson might see, they're high target shares on less volume. That's not ideal. But regardless, he should be added this week. Maybe things finally clicked for him. Add Cam Akers and Damian Pierce. Joe Mixon suffered an ankle injury on Sunday night and Houston's taking it, quote, day by day. Well, the Texans clearly don't understand that waivers run early Wednesday morning in a lot of leagues. We can't just take things day by day. It's not very helpful. But anyway, if Mixon's out, Cam Makers has a shot to see a lot of work in one of the best offenses in football. Damian Pierce was out with a hamstring injury in week two. He might not be available in week three. And Akers, who is active for the Texans, he stepped in. He got some early down work for Joe Mixon when Mixon was sidelined. And then Dare Gumbawale was sprinkled in there as well because he's their pass catching back. He's their third down back. So basically what I'm saying here is with Pierce's injury, you can still add Cam Akers because Pierce might not be able to play in week three. But if Pierce is active, I would expect him to be the number two back in this Texans offense or the number one back hypothetically if Joe Mixon were to miss time. But I don't think that Pierce would just see Joe Mixon's workload. It would probably end up being some sort of committee. Add Jawan Jennings. So on Monday evening on the East Coast, of course, Kyle Shanahan told reporters that Debo Samuel has a calf strain. He's going to be sidelined for a couple weeks. Why not? Why not have another injury to a top two, top three round guy? Why not? The next man up in that offense is Jawan Jennings. He's the only wide receiver outside of Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel to have run more than five routes against the Vikings. When a player like Debo Samuel leaves a lineup, it just means a higher concentration of targets are going to go to the established players in that lineup. So yeah, a guy like Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, they're going to see an uptick in target share. But Jawan Jennings will too. And if you want a deeper look, check out rookie Jacob Cowing. He had a really strong production profile. The Zap model actually liked him a good bit. He'll only have to beat out Chris Conley and Ronnie Bell to get on the field in three wide receiver sets. Now, the one thing I will say is Cowing mostly played in the slot in college. 
That's where Jennings has been lining up with Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk healthy. 63.5% of Jennings' routes have come from the slot. But we could just see them move Jennings to the outside and then cowing into the slot. And he could work in this offense. He's a really shifty receiver. I think Kyle Shanahan could get a lot out of him. So in deep leagues, keep Cowing's name in mind as well. But overall, I think the ad is probably Jawan Jennings. Add the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. The Buccaneers are at home this week and they get Bo Nix and the Broncos. They're six and a half point favorites. The over under in that game, depending on the book, is under 40 points. Denver's been pressured at the ninth highest rate in football to start the year. Tampa Bay has been a top half team in pressure rate. And the Broncos are a top 10 favorable opponent thus far in adjusted points allowed to opposing defenses. So the Buccaneers are a pretty obvious play.